please welcome the tribal chairman of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, Jamie Escher, the Texas director and co-founder of United We Dream, Julieta Garibay, civil rights legend and former UN ambassador, congressman, and mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young, and dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, Angela Evans. everybody. Good morning. Good morning. You have to be inspired. After three days, we're hearing, I mean, you have to be inspired by this program. So I'm really, really pleased to be part of it. I have an honor this morning because what I, what you see here are representatives of people who were here, people who came here under duress, and people who chose to be here. And we're going to talk about all of us according to how we think about our privilege to vote. But before we do that, I want to read something. This is from President Johnson. And the, the inspirational thing throughout this is hearing his words again, you know, spoken by other people or spoken by him. The vote is the most powerful instrument ever devised by man for breaking down injustice and destroying the terrible walls which imprison men because they are different from other men. So this is so fundamental to our right as a citizen to vote. So we're going to talk about how that's been suppressed. So my first question is going to go to Ambassador Young, my hero and icon. Uh, it's amazing to be here on the stage with you. I really appreciate this. Uh, Martin Luther, Luther King spoke eloquently on the steps of the, capital, of the state capital of Montgomery uh, after a successful march on Selma, and he said, how long, not long, because the arc of moral universe is long, but it bends it's towards toward justice. justice. And we've heard those words over and over, and I keep thinking about the patience behind this word. Here we are, over 50 years later, and we're still dealing with social justice issues. It seems to remain elusive. On Monday evening, you spoke so eloquently about how you think about poverty and economic security and the role of the United States in a global economic um, power, as an economic power. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you see the voting rights mesh and, and square the circle of our economic security and our role in the global economic setting? Well, we have to remember that, uh, let's start with Franklin Roosevelt uh, in 32. And we were building a, a mission that came about in part because we failed to do that after World War I. And so we were coming up on World War II. And I think President Roosevelt had a vision of a you, one nation indivisible under God. <laughs> but it was expanded to one world because he realized that you couldn't, you couldn't be free in the United States of America if other people in the world were not free. And so President Johnson carried on that legacy. And he was fulfilling a lot of the promises and dreams that had been part of the New Deal. And then something happened. And people, people wanted to give up. And the stable world that existed, I think, until, I think until 1973, uh, just began to fall apart. Until 1973, the dollar reigned supreme. The dollar was anchored to gold, and everybody's currency in the world was anchored to the dollar. And nations all over the world 
grew at from four to six percent from the end of the war to 1973. And then all of a sudden that changed and the dollar was allowed to float. Now I never took a course in economics, but I was sitting in the banking committee when this happened. And I asked them if the dollar isn't anchored to something, aren't people gonna play politics with currency? And Arthur Burns, a Federal Reserve, took a puff on his pipe and said, young man, you'll soon learn that the dollar doesn't need you to defend it. <laughs> Shut up, little boy. <laughs> Stay in your place. But we didn't. And at that time, oil was $2.50 a barrel. And it went almost to $200 a barrel over the next few years. And we saw an economic dislocation that we still don't understand. And I think that's the reason for a lot of the instability, a lot of the insecurity uh, in our nation. Uh, because we no longer believe, in fact, we've given up on the notion that we should lead a free world of democracy. And the whole, you know, the, the whole uh, turn back to nationalism is, uh, is people who don't understand how we got where we are and they don't understand that, that, that our leadership uh, had a vision, had a plan of a secure, stable planet where, well, Germany and Japan were our enemies. Uh, we have almost 500 Japanese companies in Georgia now, and we have 4,000 German companies. Uh, and we brought them into, and our economy is doing very well because we're part of a global economy. But now that didn't happen in the Midwest. Uh, and, uh, and so this economic instability uh, is making people more and more insecure. And so they want to close the borders and protect ourselves. You cannot close borders. And I said, you know, <laughs> cell phones <laughs> run the world and there are no borders that can block cell phones right now. Uh, and when you can transfer money from one part of the world to the other on a cell phone, uh, you've got to have a new vision. You've got, you cannot turn your back on the rest of the world. And that's what a lot of people are trying to do. Well, do you think this has to do with disenfranchising people in terms of them not getting out to vote? Uh, and also well, it, 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 remember we lost when President Johnson uh, left the presidency, he turned it over to Hubert Humphrey. Martin Luther King was killed. Robert Kennedy was killed. That was the most turbulent time in the life of this nation for me. But we still only lost that election by one vote per precinct. And one vote per precinct made the difference. Now, it takes 60% of the country to change uh, the laws I mean, and, and the opinions. Uh, so we do have a majority now, but it's only a slight majority. It's the difference between maybe uh, the popular vote and the college, Electoral College, uh, but we, the majority of people in America think like we want to think. <laughs> and they believe in this country, but it just takes a little bit of effort and confidence. And so, yes, there is voter suppression. 
but um, it's nothing like it was before the Voting Rights Act. But the courts have changed, the Congress has changed, and the thing that we're m missing between the economy and the courts, um, we do have a struggle. Now, I still, I, I can't give up. And so I don't want any more close elections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I learned something and, I, and then I'll shut up. But when I was, when I was, Vernon kind of left Atlanta <laughs> and they left m me running for Congress. <laughs> and it poured down rain that day. And, but we had organized block by block. We didn't spend a whole lot of money on television because we didn't have any money. But we had a 74% turnout in the black community in a pouring down rain. And that's the kind of community organizing you have to do. Mm -hmm. You can't, I mean, television will not get you out on a rainy day. And yet we put all the money in the television. And when I see television ads and the same ad is appearing twice within the same hour on the same program, that's criminal. It's criminal because the electoral gurus who are running our campaigns get a 15% kickback on TV ads. So they put a disproportionate amount of money into TV and I didn't put money in TV. I gave money to preachers to ride their, to, to, to put their, their church buses and make them available to take people to polls. We fed lunch to students and we closed down Every college in Atlanta, we closed it down from Friday till Tuesday. And we had to feed them lunch and we had to take them around knocking on doors. Uh, but when you run a grassroots campaign, you don't have to worry about voter suppression nearly as much. Now you have to worry about it, but I don't think we have the time to go through the courts and everything else. So um, what Vernon said about George Wallace has been my experience with almost every place we've uh, worked, that I end up being closer to my enemies by the time we get through and they become friends. Uh, Albany, Georgia, the, the chief of police uh, called me and asked me would I recommend him uh, for uh, a police chief uh, in uh, uh, North Carolina. And I said, yeah, I will be glad to. And I called and made a, and recommended him because I, I saw what he went through and I, I realized that he had been changed as a result of those demonstrations. You know, it, Everybody in Atlanta, when Vernon was there practicing law and I just came in, the whole town was segregationist with the possible exception of Coca-Cola. And it was a global company that had a different view. But we've seen that city change completely. Now we have a new group coming in. And so we gotta start all over. Uh, because they have not been through the, the challenges that we went through in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but we say freedom is a constant struggle. We struggle so long that we must be free. And we are. We're freer now than we've ever been before. But that doesn't mean that you ever, you know, are completely free or that you can ever stop struggling to protect and expand your freedom. It's a lifetime commitment. 
Well, you represent that. And I think what we're talking about today, too, is there is voter suppression, and every vote does count, and some of these elections are very, very close. So eliminating or try to eliminate people from the, the, the polls can cause, they, you know, can but cause they're a close. Shift. They're close. And see, I don't know how to do that. It, what well, they did in, in, in Atlanta was, well, first place, we had the Secretary of State, who was supposed to be running the election, yeah, running was running for, for governor. Right, right. Uh, and it was the, the fox guard in the hen house. Yes. Uh, and so a lot of votes didn't get counted. See? Uh, but we've lost the courts. Uh, since President Johnson, there have been very few judges that have been appointed. Uh, that continue the tradition of the Supreme Court in 1954. And, and so, rather than try to change everything and do it legally, I think we've got to, we have to have mass movements. Uh, and that's why, even back in the 70s, uh, I couldn't have done it if we had not convinced students that it was more valuable to their future. And let me just, since you're letting me talk, I'm gonna talk, so <laughs> shut me up. Well, I don't wanna cut off an icon. I mean, no, I really you can't can. do that. <laughs> but let me just say one more thing. <laughs> Suppose the $1.5 trillion tax cut that went to big business had gone, that is exactly the same amount of money that our students owe, yeah, the, the student debt. loan student debt. debt. Mm -hmm. If that yes. 1.5 trillion had been applied to wipe out all of the student debt, we would have had a rise up from the bottom of new houses, new cars, new businesses, new yeah. educational yeah. opportunities. Yeah. And the thing is, the banks and the big businesses would have still gotten the money. Mm -hmm. But instead of the government giving it to them, they would have gotten it from the students who, who wanted what they produce. We missed an opportunity to expand the economy exponentially. God knows how much a trillion dollars at the bottom of this economy would do for the world. But we, 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 we've got to think, I mean, we've got to think economically as well as politically about this. And that's because the arguments in my party seems like, I don't know, it seems like nobody in there ever had a course in economics. <laughs> I mean, we have good ideas, but ideas don't mean anything if you can't pay for them. And if you can't show how they can be paid for um, there you are. sensibly. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get into some people who are fighting the good fight and who are trying to get more uh, representation and fair elections. And we've got two individuals here with us today. And one is Spotted Eagle, which is his Chippewa name. Uh, and Jamie's been fighting in North Dakota um, in terms of voter suppression, you know, where the voter ID uh, was required to have a residential address, and many of um, the Indians, the Chippewa Indians, don't have uh, a residential address. They have a post office. But Jamie, um, which is a small, it's like uh, six miles by 12 miles, uh, the reservation in near Canada, they decided no. We're not going to put up with this. And so when we were talking to Jamie, it's like, Jamie, do we need this kind of uh, force coming in and trying to take these rights away before people will actually act? And so I, I want Jamie to tell his story to all of you and, and why, if you think about that perspective of do we need somebody to come in and say, no, you can't do this, for us to say, oh, yes, I can. Well, I guess we... The Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, our reservation is 6 by 12, but we have 36,000 enrolled members and 19,000 live on the uh, reservation. So we're a small land base, but we are a, a force by numbers. 
So this all came down very quickly. I was a tribal chairman at the time. We were notified that a Supreme Court decision was upheld and we needed to have a physical address on all IDs to be able to vote. So some will say, and I'm not going to argue the fact whether it was intentional or unintentional of a, of a voter suppression, but it was a suppression on our people. But not only Native Americans, not only the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa and the five United Tribes of North Dakota, but the rural areas, the farmers, the uh, college students, the, uh, the college students that are in dorms. They don't have a physical address. It goes right to the building. So you're, you're, the trickle-down effect is you're affecting so many other people, even though the large percentage was Native American, that it, that it would be suppressing. But what people don't understand is that 150 years ago, we were still a, a roaming tribe. We are, uh, were still chiefs. We were still warriors. And we were still water carriers back home. And that translates to what we are today. You know, the chief, instead of sitting outside in the tribe and speaking to everybody and fighting that good fight on our, on our borders, protecting our people, the chief and the warriors are now not riding a stallion and not bows and arrows and, and not a tomahawk. You know, we have a Microsoft Surface. Well. That, that's our arrows. We have a, a flight plan on a Boeing 747 to fly to Washington to fight for our rights, and that's our new stallion. So the warrior mentality is still alive and strong, but the pride is still there. And this is a whole other conversation, but there was a systematic breakdown of a culture and a, and a people, of the Native American people, the First Nations people. And there was a genocide that has been scrubbed from the history books. And all it takes is something to incite that, to bring that pride back. So the suppression of votes turned into a rising. Tell folks you only had two weeks, correct? We had two weeks. We had two weeks from the November elections when we heard about the decision. And now you have to remember in the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, we have a high poverty rate. So they came down, the courts told us, well, in order to vote in this coming election a few weeks away, your membership has to have this ID that has to have this physical address on it. And it goes back to the fact that a lot of our people have PO boxes. And it's always worked in the past. It was never an issue. And our voting, our voting numbers were low in the past. But what that did was it turned into a challenge. So it incites that pride. It incites the youth. The youth were that catalyst. The youth were that paradigm shift, as a lot of people like to say. So it incited the people to make a difference. Again, and that goes to the 36,000 enrolled members in North Dakota, which is a, a nice little percentage of, of votes. So what, what really happened was now the youth and the youth council were inspired and they wanted to get out, and they wanted to do something. And it always turns because in Native Nation, and I'm sure this is uh, the same across the country, if somebody's running for office, they always make the comment, well, we're gonna be for the youth. But then there's no, a lot of the times, there's no follow-up to that. So we decided, what can we do for the youth? What we can do for the youth in, in the Turtle Mountains was to empower the youth and bring them underneath the tribal umbrella let them become a 501c3, a nonprofit. And my first comments to them were, you have more power than the tribal chairman does. And they kind of looked and laughed. And, and I said, now, if you hold every person that's ever ran for office accountable to their words that say, we are for the youth, and if the youth council is enforced and they're, they're given that power and they turn into a strategic planning process and they put a plan together for the future of our people and they present that in a professional way, who can tell them no? It's a, it's just an empowering moment. But the youth took over. So they decided, they said, Jamie Azure, what are you gonna do to help take these barriers down? Now we have the outside putting these barriers up two weeks before elections, how are you going to help us? So we go to the tribal council and we say, okay, it costs $15 for, per uh, tribal ID. 
and our tribal IDs are the exact same size, weight, specifications of North Dakota tri or state IDs. But it's $15 in a high impoverished area. So you have to put that in perspective. $15 could be milk and a loaf of bread for, for a family for a week. Or you go out and you get a new ID because the one you paid $15 for doesn't work. But you need to pay to get this new one. So the tribal council decided we'll waive all fees, we'll see what happens, we'll, we'll tell people we'll stay, stay open later, come on in, and the first day, and we didn't know what was gonna happen. The first day, we had one printing machine, and there were so many people that came in that it started melting the IDs before they could <laughs> they shift out. So we put it on the social media. Uh, we have all these people that, that call and they want to help and they want to be part of, of this little movement that's starting. And we were able to, and this is all incurred at the cost of the tribe. So we, we bought new machines. We had get out to vote rallies. We had portable machines that went to each rally. So if you didn't have a tribal ID, we're not going to charge you for it. Come to the rally, listen to, the, to uh, our rights. This is, this is why we need to get out and vote, make an educated decision. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but do your research. So we went through all of this little process. The uh, tribe incurred all these costs, but we've seen all these people going in. Our motor vehicle department that issues the tribal IDs volunteered to stay open until 9 o'clock at night, so people that were working there in the day were able to go. And we have a tribal college, one of the best in the nation, and they wanted to put a machine there, so we're integrated with the BIA services, so we're, we're switching and getting people that, that physical address based off of what the Bureau of Indian Affairs has in their GIS system that tells us our, our street mapping. And the youth come in and they go to the college and they say, all right, they're gonna do this, they're taking the barriers down, now it's back on us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a call center in the college. We're going to have, we're gonna put it out on social media, we're gonna have them call, we're gonna pick them up, we're gonna go, we're gonna take them to get registered, we're gonna take them to vote, and then we're gonna march from our high school and the student council of our high school, the youth council, and all the youth that, that, uh, that were involved marched from our high school a half a mile in a blizzard. <laughs> and they marched through downtown Belcourt, which is the heart of, of the Turtle Mountains. Mm -hmm. So they brought that fight forward. It incited that pride. It brought that warrior mentality back. And they're going to have to cut me off too here, sir. You said something, Chief. You said you have Arrow is the surface, Microsoft surface. Microsoft owns a company that gave identification to over a billion people in India. And they, um, they, they do an iris scan, mm -hmm. 10 fingerprints, uh, a signature, uh, a picture, uh, and you have a number. And I bet you if you went to Microsoft and asked them to do for your tribe what they did for the entire nation of India, a billion and a half people almost. And that's their identification. And you can't lose it, it's not like a passport. Yep. <laughs> it goes with you everywhere and, and I don't think the courts could deny that. Maybe we should As, try it everywhere. Well, we, uh, that's what well, I'm I mean, saying. I mean, I'm not being but facetious, I'm, but I think But, you... but to, to start it uh, with the original people of our nation, mm -hmm taking yeah. the lead once again, yeah. we'd be glad to follow you no, that and work with cool. you. <laughs> Just to finish on the, uh, on the answer, and I'm sorry that I, I veer off, but we do live on a reservation. We are a native people, and there's a microscope over these reservations mm -hmm. that magnify the bad things that happen. So. We're trying to shift that dialogue. We're trying to shift in the social media, grassroots. We're getting the good out. So if I ramble on about our people of the Turtle Mountains, it's because I am so proud of, of the good that we have. 
And it's and it's very very seldom talked about before no. these last couple of years. But the Turtle Mountains did double their votes. We hit over 5,000. We had the incredible Hulk, Hulk Mark Ruffalo come in ahead of time. Now he's coming back. If he said we could hit that number, which was 42 percent higher than the pre than two years before with our voting output, and that was the youth. That was the youth being informed. That was the youth shifting that paradigm from the matriarch and patriarch, telling you this is how we want you to vote. The youth started saying, this is where we want to be, and this is how we're going to get to that. So that is that social cycle impact point that we needed to not... That social cycle's been going on for 200 years. We're not going to switch it in five, but you make that impact point and you start reversing that cycle, and it's going to gain momentum. And that's what I am most proud of with our people. Mm -hmm. And that... <laughs> I think the North Dakota vote was is one of the votes that uh, it sustains the Affordable Health Care Act, and um, I mean you, you're in a position where one vote in your Senate and uh, can can lead the whole nation. So. If you start something like that, all of us will rally behind you because we need you to get the, those those votes. We can't we can't afford to lose health care, and everybody's you know got a fancy approach to it. But it, I mean, you're not any bigger than Selma. Uh -huh. See, Selma is just fifteen thousand people, and. I thought Martin Luther King was crazy when he said uh, t he was going to get President Johnson some power. I mean, that's ridiculous. He, he was nobody. I mean, he was not as big as you and not, I mean, he had a, more money and more reputation, but it was the faith that a little city like Selma could change America that got the Voting Rights Bill passed and empowered the president. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you all, uh, you, you all are in the eye of the, the eagle right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is the underlying effect though. You know, the Turtle Mountains are 36,000 strong, but we have a unified tribes where each chairman of North Dakota and South Dakota meet once a month, first Friday of every month, and, and we discuss issues. We're sovereign nations, we are a nation inside of a nation. So it's almost they a... Don't give up your vote. <laughs> it's, a, it's nations working together. Yeah. But you, you put that membership together just in North Dakota. But if you show that we can work together moving forward, now you're talking about 547 plus tribes across this nation unifying for the greater good of not only our people, but all minorities, all races. You know, when Martin Luther King, just, be just before he was killed, we had a number of the tribes come to Atlanta and the Poor People's Campaign would have brought black, white, brown, Cesar Chavez was there. Uh, and uh, because we were looking at poor people and, and that, that's a majority. Uh, so we'd, we'd be glad to follow your leadership. Let us know. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, there's a quote I was going to read. I, I think it's, it's apropos now. And this is from Lyndon Baines Johnson as well. At times, history and fate meet in a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So here we've got different generations and, you know, going through very similar things and just... I, I, this is a pretty moving moment. This was not planned. I just think this is amazing that um, Jamie and Ambassador, you're yeah. able to connect on this. And I want to get Julietta in, um, involved in this. Um, <laughs> because, you know, we want to have something to say. <laughs> we sit quietly, but this is an amazing young woman. And she's one of us. She's a UT grad in public health nursing. <laughs> Um, and as a citizen by choice, um, we talked about that. You know, those of us who are born here don't have to raise our hand and say we're going to uphold the Constitution, but those who choose to come here do that. And Julia did that. Julietta did that. Julieta. 
And uh, Julieta um, has been, she's a, a founder and a co-director of um, an organization called United We Dream. And she's been doing a lot of work with bringing attention to people who are here who are foreign born and immigrants. And in Texas, uh, he has a, a, a movement uh, to look at voter fraud uh, here and to count, you know, count how much uh, voters are, are abusing the system. And Julieta has a, a, um, a suit against the state of Texas. But what I wanted to talk to her about and what I, I wanted to talk to all of you about, but I wanted Julieta's perspective because you've worked so hard on this, is uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, she was talking about when she was a dissenter in the, um, the Shelby case. She said, uh, let me make sure I've got this right. The struggle for fairness in elections is not over, though the tactics of those who would suppress voting has changed. So when you think of, she calls it the second generation of tools to suppress voting. So Julieta, you've been involved in this. Talk to us a little bit about the things that you've come up against and how you've tried to you know, rally around those and educate people about those. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Really proud to be here um, and very honored um, by the colleagues. Um, I, I think I want to start at the fact that I came here undocumented. Uh, for 26 years, I was an undocumented immigrant, um, and that's how my struggle started. Um, my mother chose to come here to Austin, Texas, um, and I was able to adjust my status through what's called VAWA, <coughs> Violence Against Women Act. Um, and so I am a survivor of domestic violence. That's how I was able to actually get my legal permanent residency, and then I, w I chose to become a U.S. citizen. And I chose to become a U.S. citizen because I strongly believe that voting is one of those powerful tools that we can use. And so, yes, I completely agree. One of the strongest tools is to go out there and door knock. Um, and it's one of my favorite things to do. We just did it this past November, and it was so energizing to see undocumented immigrant youth knocking at doors and saying, I'm undocumented. I need your vote. Um, and, getting, and, getting people, um, and getting people to say, yes, I commit to you because I believe this country is better than where we're at right now. Um, and so now, fast forward to I became a US citizen, and then all of a sudden, um, in February, uh, the Texas Secretary and the Attorney General and the Governor um, say there is a, almost 100,000 fraud uh, voters um, that are not US citizens. Uh, as I start reading their story, I realized I am one of them, um, because in Texas, uh, when you get your, when you renew your license, you're supposed to show your lawful, lawful, um, lawful permanent residency, um, and that allows you to actually get a license. Um, however, you're not supposed to go back to DPS and let them know I became a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the list that they pulled out was, um, first of all, blatantly um, showing that there was voter suppression. They were trying to say a bunch of U.S. citizens had actually committed fraud. Um, and so I started getting engaged, and I, and I think that's, that was one of the new tactics that they're using. Um, how do you put fear into people to believe that there is voter fraud happening in Texas and in many other states? How do you make sure you keep them quiet? Um, and, I, and as I grew up as undocumented immigrant, I was always told, stay quiet. Don't even speak so they can't hear your accent. Um, try to assimilate as much as you can. And I think through the movement, I've been able to realize that, no, I'm not going to stay quiet, that I do need to speak my truth. Um, and not only for me to actually ensure that we are providing the tools to young folks, um, to older folks, to know they also have power. Um, I think the most frustrating part about this whole voter um, suppression thing was that there is people out there that might have gotten those calls, that might have gotten that letter saying, you might have committed voter fraud. And there's yes. people out there in our community as an organizer for almost 15 years that I know when you get those letters, you wonder, did I do something wrong? Mm -hmm. Am I gonna end up in jail for rightfully going out to vote? And so to me, that's the most outraging part that they did this very blatantly. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't the DPS director. It was a very clear tactic to ensure that black and brown folks would not go out to vote, especially those who just became naturalized. And that's why I organize. That's why I'll continue organizing. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, 
that, though, when you've done this and you've worked at this, how can this, uh, your energy and the power that you have, how can you grow that? How can we preempt some of this, you know, these, these the, we're talking about voter suppression this morning, but how do you preempt those types of things? We've had this in the past, and, you know, we always say, like, yes, this is a tactic, this is a tactic, and we're reacting to that tactic. So talk to us a little bit about if you had your will and you had a magic wand and you could change this, how do we think about these things and stop them from happening? Um, I think I completely agree with both of the speakers. Um, I think it's going out to the streets. Um, expecting that, yeah, if you do some social media, yeah, it helps. Um, clearly, the current person who runs this country thinks Twitter is a way to talk to people and use his megaphone. That's one tool. Um, but the other stronger tool is to go out there and knock, to talk to your community and ask them, what do you want? What do you foresee? What is your vision of your city, of your country? Um, to go local. Um, I think that has been one of the biggest lessons that I've learned, um, that the more you go and, and talk to people, the more you're here, and the more you realize that we all want something better for our youth, uh, for our elders, um, for our community, that we want to actually live freely and not worry about um, either being caught by La Migra or being killed by a police, um, or being, try, being silenced um, by different tactics. And so I think to me, the biggest thing is go grassroots, go to the people, talk to the people. Um, that's where I get a lot of my energy. That's where I think a lot of people realize who we can be as a country. Well, yeah, when you go out, I, I'm trying to put in my mind this idea of actually uh, voter registration, suppressing that with vote actually participating in the vote. You know, when people have the ability to vote, but then don't go and vote. So, you know, I put those two together. Uh, and we do have problems with people not going to vote. So when, and when you go out and talk to people from your grassroots or how you've gotten the youth all invited and, you know, excited about these things, and you, Ambassador, how do you put those two together? Because, you know, we say we, we want the right to vote, and then people say, well, you don't, when you get the right, you don't vote. Well, we don't vote because nobody takes the time to tell us what the results will, what we're getting. And I think that the thing that changed last year's election was people had personal experiences with healthcare. That yeah. if you can't get your blood pressure medicine, doing nothing means death. I mean, that, that the fastest growing group of people People in my age group. I know you millennials are, are, are powerful. Well, I'm with you. I'm not a, I mean. No, I know. But I, I'm, a I'm a perennial. Like, a, yeah, you know. Yeah, we're perennials. And, but that, that number and just letting them know that, um, you know, I mean, the kids from uh, Parkland got organized very quickly. You have gotten your group organized very quickly. Once you get your cause defined, and that, that's what, just define a cause that everybody is interested in, and, and you can organize people around almost anything. You have to sustain it and persist. Yeah. You have to persist, and you have to have leadership. Um, that but shows I, I think that, that what Jamie's saying was that for me, I mean, really, Surface, Microsoft, did lead the organization of voter ID. It wasn't voter ID. All of their benefits come through that in India now. And it saves so much money that uh, even though the middle class and upper classes didn't need to do it, they went to do it, so nobody carries any money anymore. So it doesn't get stolen. So yeah. you can go anywhere, and your fingerprints or your iris scan mm -hmm. is all the identification you need. You can go, go to the grocery store and do that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if they can do it for a billion people in India, and you get started in South and North Dakota, your nation's down in Georgia and Alabama, I mean, just follow the casinos. Yeah. <laughs> and if every casino becomes a headquarters, you know, then uh, we can do that. Go ahead. Um, 
So uh, one of the favorite things that I do is uh, we do citizenship drives uh, with some of our partners, Texas AFL. Um, and, and this is where you bring in people who are eligible to actually become US citizens and you help them through the entire process. It's a long process. You have to study 100 questions. You have to make yes. sure all the paperwork is checked. And my most favorite part about it is when I ask, when they go through the entire thing, it usually takes three hours or four or more, um, and then I take pictures of them and I ask them, what are you most excited about when you become a citizen? And they tell me, I'm gonna go vote because I'm gonna be the voice of my people. And so to me, I think that's one part, right? How do we continue to ensure that people who are eligible to become citizens become and know how important it is to vote? But I also think it's how do we make sure that, especially as the 2020 is coming along, that people don't take certain communities for granted. Um, I, I've heard that there's many times where it's like, well, they don't vote, so we don't have to go to them, That's right? What I get. And yes. so to me, uh, to me, when we were door knocking in Houston as well as in Irving, um, and we were actually able to, our sister organization, United We Dream Action, was able to elect the first Latina, youngest, um, Harris County judge, Lina Hidalgo. Mm -hmm. And it was through their door knocking in mainly low propensity voters that usually nobody talks to because they think they don't matter. And so I think to us, and, and to me, the, the movement is ensuring that how do we make sure we, we give the tools and the information and feel that, make them feel empowered to say, yes, I do matter and that's why I have to go out and vote. Uh, because many of them hardly ever hear from many of the candidates. Um, they usually only talk to a certain group of folks who know oh, for sure they'll go out and vote and I think the problem specifically here in Texas is that we're not a red state. We're a state that doesn't vote. And so our job as movement leaders is, um, is to make sure that we actually go and door knock on those people that have been told, oh, you don't matter. Oh, why should I talk to you if you're not gonna go out and vote? Um, that's where it's at, I think. I know we're no, no. 40 seconds over the clock, but. <laughs> There's a big clock here telling us. <laughs> But to answer your, uh, the magic wand question, yes. Native Nation doesn't need a magic wand. All Native Nation needs is somebody to say, no, you can't, and that's going to unite everybody. <laughs> well, I don't know about you. If you've been listening uh, over the last couple of days, it's this that gives you inspiration that says we have to keep going. We're doing, they're doing such great things, and we need to get behind them in some way, however way you think you can make a difference. So I want to thank them so much for coming today and sharing this with us and sharing this with all of you. And I think we've got a little movement going here right on uh, uh, between these generations. So thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it.